Great Wednesday. Welcome to the Fully Human Connections podcast. I'm your host, King. I'm joined by my co-host, Reggie. And despite our late start, which was on me, I apologize, listening audience, for that. We're going to still provide you all an entertaining, enlightening, and informative show. So with that being said, how are you doing today, Reggie? Doing well, King. As I always say, um, it's kind of, it's rote, but it's true. Um, every Wednesday morning we speak is a, is a good morning for me. So I'm, I'm good. Absolutely. So am I. So with that being said, let's get started with our gratitude moment. So um, I'm grateful for my life, my health, my ability to see, hear, walk, talk, stand, breathe, and have a sound mind. Grateful for another 24 hours to pursue my purpose in life. Grateful for my mother to be alive, still have sound mind, and still be here to connect with her energy. Grateful for the ability to be able to do the podcast still and all the infinite possibilities this day is going to provide. So, yeah, yeah. So, uh, I, I'm very happy again, as always, to have indoor plumbing, uh, electricity, especially as it uh, keeps my refrigerator going, gives me access pretty much whenever I want to good food. Um, the quality of the food is up to me, but I've been blessed my whole life to have both those things. Um, so, there, there's, there taken for granted in many places, but I don't think I've ever taken them for granted. That said, I also am grateful for having a body that regularly works you know, more or less normally and healthily. Um, a mind that as far as I can tell is sound and still um, loves to learn and loves to share. And um, I'm just grateful for having really good friends as well. So uh, you know, with that, I'm ready to go. Excellent. Excellent. Well, why don't you walk us into our topic for today, then? Yeah. So, again, for those of you who might be new to this podcast, we've been speaking for over a year now about healing America's narratives. It's the title of a book that I published in 2022. Um, the subtitle is The Feminine, the Masculine, and Our Collective National Shadow. Um, and the little tagline in the subtitle is Becoming More Fully Human. And what we've been doing for the past probably six episodes now, is we've been taking a deeper dive into the nine elements of shadow, um, this collective national shadow that the book is is grounded in. And last episode, we spoke about violence and we realized that we um, had more to say about it. So we're going to continue the discussion of violence um, in American history and in American current events. And in the context of the other elements of shadow that we've already discussed in some at some length which are ignorance arrogance fear and bigotry so not that there's any particular order although ignorance seems to be a good point where we usually start um, but very often i would argue that violence does emerge through some combination of ignorance arrogance um, fear and bigotry so again, this is um, violence in American history and current events, part two, in the larger context of what it will take to heal America's narratives and integrate the country's collective national shadow. That's where we are. Yeah, I'm glad that you chose that we would revisit violence again since um, last week. I believe it's such an important topic and we see it so relevant in today's media and our society today. I know that, you know, living in a, you know, one of the most violent cities in America, I see it broken down every single day. And I can't even watch news. Uh, for example, one of the local news channels here is Fox 45. And I don't know if it's, a, you know, they're owned by a parent company, Fox or not. But I tell you one thing that, that news show if you watch that news show only for your source of information, I mean, it starts off with the show with, you know, two, four, three, you know, deaths. That's how the show starts off. Good morning. We had last night, there was a horrific shooting, and then there was carjacking, and there was violence, there's corruption within the city, then there's the weather, and then it's over. And that's the show, that's the news broadcast. Yeah. So if you're allowing yourself to receive that kind of information, then how can you walk out on a daily basis unless you're filtering 
for the amount of some other kind of positive information to offset that. But without doing that, I don't see how a person could walk out the door and feel good about themselves. And if you're not feeling good about yourself, speaking of a personal um, experience and what of my experience with others, that to me are the building blocks to being triggered, which may lead to violence. Yeah, so I, I agree with that. I mean, the um, and that's where that idea of ignorance, I'm going to stay with ignorance for a second. Um, if, the, if my only source of information about the world beyond my little circle of whether it's work or family or friends is, let's say, that particular station that you refer to, Fox 45, um, then that's going to be how the world is to me. Um, that's, you know, it's about violence. You know, here's the killings from last night. Now let's go to the weather. There's almost like a, you know, a dark humor to that. If you, if you think about it, um, here's, you know, maybe the, the, I don't know if they throw sports in or not. So violent sports and weather, you know, news sports and weather. Um, and what I'm going to share now is, is kind of anecdotal. So I can't say this is, I want to, you know, put an asterisk next to it. So I don't know what the research is on this. But my sense is that during the Donald Trump administration or during any Republican administration, the news sources such as um, NSN, MSNBC or you know, CNN that, that are accused of leaning left, they would show a lot more of what was going wrong in the world because they disagreed with the president at the time. Now with a Biden administration, which is really a kind of a center administration. I mean, people can say it's left-leaning and it's more left-leaning than Trump was, but Joe Biden isn't particularly a far left figure. Um, that the stations like Newsmax or Fox will highlight the violence and the things that are wrong. And then somebody will speak to, you know, it's the woke left and Joe Biden that don't enforce law, you know, don't have any law enforcement behind. So. A lot of what we're fed, and, I, and this is the sad part about um, broadcast journalism now, it is politically motivated. So much of it is politically motivated. Now that's an aside. There is everyday violence in this country. So that's that's the truth. I mean, just, and people will view violence. There's something, you know, maybe it's because most people aren't, um, violent in their everyday lives and it's the type of thing where it's sensational and they get to vicariously experience something that if they're fortunate they never are victims of a crime and you know hopefully the majority of people don't commit violent crimes um but just as an example like over the weekend there was a in montgomery alabama there was a um, a paddle boat um, a riverboat incident on one of the docks in the river in Montgomery, where this big paddle boat, which is a you know tourist thing, was coming into its regular docking spot, and there was a private pontoon boat, a smaller boat in the way, and the captain got on a loudspeaker and basically said, "Please move. You're blocking our, you know, the official spot where this riverboat docks every day comes and goes." And the owners of the um, pontoon boat, the private boat, just ignored him. So one of their, the co-captain or the, I guess like one of the captains of the riverboat disembarked, came down a gangway um, and got onto the dock and began speaking to the private um, boat owner. And you can see it, people videotaped this, it was an argument. The captain was dressed in his white shirt, baseball cap, which is part of his uniform and black shorts. And he was African-American, all of the private um, folks on a private boat were white. And it was an animated conversation. They were ignoring the requests to, to get out of the way. And at one point when he's talking to one of the private owners, another person from this boat just came running in and punched him. And then, you know, all hell broke loose. And it went on for, I don't know how long, um, but women got involved. Um, people across the on the other side of the dock, so it was happening, swam into the water to come and get involved in it. Some were coming to the aid of the um, the, the riverboat co-captain. 
and some were coming to join in beating him. Um, and th this is, you know, th the underlying threat I'm trying to get to. And they're, they're arguing whether or not it's a racial incident. It began as move your boat because this public boat needs to dock at its regular place. But the question is, would all these white guys have jumped on this black guy had he been a white guy? And we don't know the answer to that yet. But charges are being filed. But the point I, I want to get to is the guy that started the fight who threw the first punch, he saw a request to do what he was supposed to do, get his private boat out of the way of this municipal boat that regularly docked in the spot. He saw the solution to that request as punching the captain or co-captain of the riverboat. So this underlying... I would say lack of development, this underlying ignorance, maybe arrogance as well. Maybe it was bigotry. Maybe this wouldn't have happened had the riverboat captain been white. I don't, you know, we don't know that. Um, but this underlying thread in this country where if we disagree about something, the way we're going to resolve it is physical violence. Um, and Most of the people that I know personally don't do things that way. Um, you know, we, I, I get angry. I know how to get angry. I, I'm, I get frustrated really easily. Um, but the idea of thinking that hitting someone or shooting someone or stabbing someone or whatever is going to resolve the issue at hand, I know it's only going to make it worse. Right? You know. You know, other than in moments of defending your own life or life of someone that you love, that instigating violence is only going to make whatever's going on worse. So what is it? Again, ignorance, arrogance. Was it, in this case, bigotry? You know, racism as a form of bigotry that initiated this. It's, a, it's an ongoing issue, um, not only in America, but... Americans have proven that they're really good at violence, um, and we engage in it on a regular basis. So it's it's a, it's a really frightening uh, realization, and I don't have the re the answers to it. You're um, I can't hear you. No. How about now? Yep, got it. <laughs> sorry for the community. Sorry for the technical issues. Well, you know, I'm glad you brought that situation up because that particular uh, ordeal you described had a lot of layers to it. And the reason I say that is definitely, you know, it was a racial layer because the black community that I'm connected with, you know, they've sent that video out. It's been viral. Folks yeah. are commenting on it. And what's interesting to me is they're celebrated as a way of saying, well, this is what black unity looks like. They were this white mob beating this black person up and the blacks came to help them out. Now, what I find to be interesting about that, and this is folks happy about that. That's how, unfortunately, I would say fractured community is within the race, the black race, that is that they look at that as the only way that we can actually have unity is through violent means, where I'm going with this. Hmm. And it takes violence to bring about unity. And that they were happy to have this violent moment trigger this unity because the unity felt good. And the sad thing about it is the fact that the unity is there on a daily basis to be created around love. 
as opposed to violence. That's where I'm going with this, you know, and it takes, unfortunately, it takes a racial incident like that to bring about any interest in being unified, you know. So that really shows where violence is really at the core, and I believe the DNA of most Americans. Unless, again, I, I put the caveat out there to say, unless you're doing something on a daily basis, and it has to be daily basis, to work your plan and move toward being more fully human, then society is going to sweep you up in this violence energy that's permeating throughout our TV sets, throughout our media, throughout our music, throughout our magazines, throughout our social media. It's going to permeate and it's going to have you be in that position where you are feeling as though the way the world is against you, whether you're black, whether you're white, whether you're male, whether you're female, whether you're straight, whether you're gay, whether you're whatever your religious affiliation dogma may be, is not doesn't matter. You're going to feel some form of attack against you that the only way to really deal with that, and it depends on how far down the rabbit hole you've fallen before you say, well, the only way to deal with that is to be violent. That's the only way I can show my reaction, my frustration for this injustice that's been perpetrated against me. And to me, that's is the part that really I find it be interesting, but also I find it be disappointing because what I would love to see and folks coming together, like that's just flip the script and say that someone on that first vessel was drowning and they had to put a riverboat over and people jumped in the water to help this person. White person drowning, black person pulls a riverboat over, helps this person out people on the dock all um, coming to the aid of this person, give them CPR, save this person's life. My question would be, same people, same races, same environment. Would the video have gone just as viral? Would be my question. If love had been the catalyst, would it be just as, would it have gone just as viral? Yeah, Matt, that's a, a great question. And because the moment of somebody or several people jumping into the water to save someone and pulling them up and getting them onto the dock. And even if let's say CPR is administered, it's not going to go on as long as the fight did. And so it's, it's, first of all, it's not going to be as long. You can't watch more punches thrown. You can't, it's only one person getting saved. And so, I mean, it has to do with attention, I don't want to say attention deficit disorder, but it has to do with how, you know, we're so accustomed to, oh, look at that. Oh, look at that. Oh, look at that. But the ongoing violence holds our attention. Um, but it's a great question because uh, there, there are, in fairness, there are wonderful examples of whether it's, you know, there was more flooding in the in the Northeast this past weekend and on the East Coast in general. There was more. Um, severe weather. There were people out helping other people, whether it was um, public officials helping a woman out of a car that was up to its, you know, over the over the door in terms of flooding waters and got her out. Um, but for whatever reason, that that doesn't have the staying power of a good brawl um, for some reason, and it's um. Yeah, that's that's a really good question, because those do exist. I mean, saving somebody from drowning, um, somebody of one color coming to the aid of another color, um, you, you know, whether it's a, you know a, a police officer helping a citizen or a citizen coming to help a police officer, there are plenty of those out there, um, and not necessarily helping them with a violent moment. But there's something about the violence that that draws us in, um, and it's you know people will argue what I'm going to say next, but physical violence is the you know we, when we say violent we usually mean the physical violence, whether it's gunshots, whether it's you know grabbing, punching, kicking, wrestling, whatever it happens to be. But there's a there's an emotional and verbal violence in this country 
you know, the, one of the two best places to see it, besides on a street somewhere, are on the, you know, in hearings in the U.S. Congress and in um, talking heads on television shows when they actually invite somebody with a different opinion onto a show and they don't speak as though they're chronological adults. It's it's almost like they should just voice over and have them say, na 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 That's what it sounds like, little kids in a park somewhere. Um, so again, that's is that really violence? You know, yes or no, depending on your perspective. But it's the, it, it feeds into that us against them, that unhealthy version of in-group bias, where it's increasingly easier to throw a punch, fire a weapon, um, tackle somebody, or say horrible things about them. And that's the ongoing, you know, it's almost trite to say it in August of 2023, but it's the ongoing deepening of the polarizations in this country. And the one of the saddest things from that particular episode for me is I don't know exactly where that happened, what part of Montgomery it was in Montgomery, Alabama, but that's the, you know, this, the, the city in which, you know, some of the most um, disturbing footage from the civil rights movement came out, you know, the coming John Lewis and several hundred other marchers coming across the Edmund Pettus Bridge and being beaten by the state police, the local police and local citizens while the cameras were running, um, you know, which was specifically about race, um, that we still see what happened over the weekend because some guys didn't want to move their boat. And it wasn't, you know, there wasn't even a question of whether the riverboat captain was right or wrong. He was right. This is where the riverboat docks every day to embark and disembark passengers. And this little pontoon boat was in the way and they asked him to please move and they didn't. Um, and it ended up in a physical altercation. I mean, that, if you take a look at just that, I mean, I, I wonder, and this is a bias I have. So I see a bunch, of, a bunch of older white guys with bellies, all due respect to older men with bellies, with their shirts off. And I'm wondering how much alcohol was involved. Like how much did alcohol come into play there? Because I can't believe that these guys are on a pontoon boat and refused to leave when the riverboat came in and they weren't drinking or drunk or drinking. Now, I could be completely wrong about that. Um, but, you know, I just, that, that's my kind of stereotyping certain elements of, of the white culture. Um, shirts off, big bellies, however old they were, you know, alcohol um, made it even worse. But again, that's, that's um, I want to emphasize that's my own personal bias, and I could be 100% off on that. <laughs> you know, and the, and the, the uh, local, I don't know if he was a sheriff or the chief of police who, who made a public statement, they didn't mention alcohol at all, um, you know, in the initial statement that they made, if anybody was drunk. So. Yeah, you know, what's interesting is that I guess the internet doesn't want us to talk about this violent subject because we keep having cynical issues. Uh, you know, we've gone over easily 70 shows we never had any technical issues until we talked about violence and last week we had some technical issues and this week i see i keep having lighting issues that keeps uh passing and as a result my image of me just darkens as a result of the lighting so fortunately that's going to be problematic throughout our discussion today so please bear with me with that but you know it was interesting to your point that location um, and doing some research that I've done was the site where many Africans were actually uh, traded there. So okay. a lot of Africans actually were enslaved and were sold off there as an auction block. So it had a lot of history as a result of that as well. But again, what I'm looking to do, and I didn't want to chime in with my other people I have things in common. And this, and this is why I really talk about the importance of and distinguish, distinguish 
of common versus alignment. Because people are the same color, obviously, we're going to have a lot of things in common, you know, and that commonality is, is what people mistakenly believe is going to be a connecting energy that brings people together. Where it's, I call it a false illusion because it may bring you together, but it won't keep you together. There's no, there's no strength, there's no ties and commonality. Ties are only created, or threads are only created when there's alignment. That's when you're able to go deeper. And that goes beyond a person's race, gender, sexual orientation, religion, or ethnicity. So again, I'm just disappointed to see that, again, violence, it seems to be more interesting to the masses of people because than love is. And I really believe that's because that's what the media, see, it's a proverbial chicken before the egg, right? The media's argument is that's what people want to see and that's what they're going to click on. Well, I tend to believe, though, that's what the only thing you're selling people, so they've gotten used to clicking on that. But I think most people want to experience love and experience happy stories. It's just that they don't get a, you have to go out of your way now to kind of find that. You have to look for those fringe type of situations. And then a lot of times people who are advocating love are either tied to a certain religion or tied to a certain cult. So then there's that apprehension for being involved in this, from that. So you just don't get love from a regular conversation from regular people with no agenda of trying to recruit you in and have you join their particular um, sect, religion, or cult. So as an engineer in me, you know, a problem solver, I'm always looking at what can we do to really reduce violence, um, to eliminate violence. I know we can never eliminate violence because it's always going to be in some form or fashion. It's going to be part of our culture and part of our DNA. But if we can significantly reduce the number of situations where a violent altercation happens, that is the path I'm looking for and pursuing. So with that being said, what do you think is something that people can begin to allow themselves to focus on, put their energy, their thoughts towards something else that's not violent, centered? Yeah, so that's a great question, I, and I wouldn't, and I'm going to answer it because I don't know any better. <laughs> um, I wouldn't pretend to have, you know, obviously if I had the antidote to violence, my name would be up there with um, Dr. King and Gandhi and Christ and Buddha and, and other folks. Um, but I want to be, I want to begin, because I love the question, I want to begin by mentioning something that Jason Reynolds is, a, is an African-American author, specifically an author of books for for uh, young people, um, children and adolescents, and specifically targeting African-American community. He's African-American himself. I think I mentioned that already. And he's very successful. You know, he's done some really good work. He wrote a, you know, with Ibram Kendi, they, they wrote a uh, kind of a, a, an adolescence version of Stamped from the Beginning and how to be an anti-racist. They just took principles from there and put them together and made them readable for younger kids. Um, but Jason Reynolds was once on uh, the On Being podcast with Krista Tippett. And Krista Tippett has been interviewing folks for, I think, over 20 years now, and you know, has had um, everyone from from the late John Lewis on to Jason Reynolds to the poet Naomi Shihab Nye and others, but had some really good interviews. And she asked him in a very delicate moment, I'd say two years ago now, maybe longer. You know, you know, so how do you define anti-racism? And um, his response was something like this. This is the essence of it, it's not verbatim. He said, anti-racism is that muscle that each of us has that says, I love you for who you are, and that when I look at you, you remind me more of myself 
than not. So I'm going to repeat that. And again, this is pretty close to how we said it. Um, you know, anti-racism is that muscle that says, I love you for who you are in that you remind, when I look at you, you remind me more of myself than not. Now, here's where education, ignorance, arrogance come into play. <clears throat> if we if we know even a you know layperson's knowledge of the evolution of you know what led to modern humans, which we are, you know, probably postmodern humans now, and our earliest ancestors, you know, which depending on what model you use and which anthropologist or archaeologist you read, um, it's tens or hundreds of thousands of years ago when we first began to emerge and dif got differentiated from our close cousins in the um, the ape world, gorillas and chimpanzees and bonobos. <clears throat> and it wasn't until we began to form tribes and then nations and nation states um, that we began to differentiate via, you know, everything from language to appearance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the differentiation lost what we have in common. Generally speaking, each of us has about 200, I think it's 208 bones. A couple of, you know, if we're healthy, if we're you know, lucky enough to be born in a healthy way, one nose, two eyes, a couple of ears, a spleen, two kidneys. But I won't go on, you know, I won't list everything. And so when we talk about race, which again is a social construct, you know, there's almost no disagreement on that anywhere where people are moderately well informed. Um, the way to talk about race is the human race. You know, we're, we're in the same species. Now, it's important when we say that, it's not to say, hey, we're all the same anyway, so let's forget about history. Because if we forget about history, we'll continue to repeat it. So when I say that, you know, one way to begin to, you know, look at this problem with violence is coming at every other human being from a place of love. Now, we've been focused on race because I raised that recent event in Montgomery with the riverboat. And so that became a, you know, we, we kind of tied in the race and the violent conversation. But the idea of seeing another being who we can recognize as part of one of our own species, again, with all those same traits. Um, now, there are people who will become jockeys, and there are people who become professional basketball players. So there's different sizes and different skill sets. Some become poets, some become accountants. But it's the same species. And so, what? So, I, here's where I'm going with this. Um, I'm going to mention three views of love in just a second. But get really clear if you want not to be violent. Get really clear on what it is inside of you. And we all have this. I know I have it. What is it inside of me that leads me to think? that the best way to deal with this other human being or those other human beings is through physical violence. But the best thing I can do in this scenario is to hurt somebody else. Um, and rather, what might it be in this moment with this other human being? What might be the best thing I can do to take away any fear or anger, or at least alleviate any fear or anger in this moment with this other human being. Because Buddha said, you know, 2,500 years ago, give or take, um, violence never ceases by violence. It's only through love that violence ceases. And that was transcribed and used by Gandhi. It was used by Dr. King. Hatred never ceases by hatred only through love this hatred ceases. Um, and so the idea of, 
of really living in a place of love, um, which is easier to do if you're in a loving family in a more or less loving community in a loving town somewhere than it is, as, as you said, you live in one of the most violent country, uh, cities in the country. Um, so there's a real propensity and there's a fear of violence. But there's still this moment when we have a choice of, oh, they want me to move my boat. I think I'll attack the riverboat captain, as opposed to they want me to move my boat. Um, he's just doing his job. His boat does belong here. You know, whatever the reason I don't want to move my boat, maybe we can have a conversation. So it's just an, every time there's this human encounter, it's two beings who have the same species. And to go back to what Jason Reynolds said, you remind me more of myself than not. Now, you know, just to, the last thing I'll say, I know I'm speaking for a long period of time here. So you and I have never met in person. Some people who have listened to this podcast before know that. Um, we've known each other for you know under a year and a half, coming up on a year and a half, only online. Um, we don't look alike, as far as I can tell, whether your lighting is good or not. <laughs> we don't look like each other. Um, but it's really clear that when you and I first met and we began to speak with each other, um, you reminded me more of myself than not. Okay, vastly different backgrounds. Our parents did different things. Um, you know, your dad was a, a police officer. My dad was a plumber. We both began with P. That was about as much as they had in, in common. Um, but going back to what you said, this idea of alignment or attunement, you know, we were aligned. We were attuned to each other. Not that we agree on every single thing, but there's this you know, the underlying alignment that we share. Once we get to know each other as human beings, the generic we, not just you and me now, and we really pay attention and we care, we're able to find those parts of the other that do in fact remind us more of ourselves and then not. So throwing that first punch, tackling somebody, or worst case scenario, aiming the weapon at them and, and, and pulling the trigger become ridiculous actions that don't make any sense anymore. Now, I'm sit, saying that sitting here as a 69-year-old guy who's never been any taller than five, six and a half and weighs about 135 pounds. Nowadays, the idea of violence is terrifying to me. I have hip replacements. I'm, you know, I'm not physically strong. I can get knocked over really easily. If I punch someone, it's probably not going to make much of a difference <laughs> because it's not going to hurt that much. Um, you know, I'm, I'm laughing as I say that, but those are literally true. The idea of being in a fight nowadays for me is like, you know, doesn't make any sense because it's winning it's probably not going to happen but i also have spent decades reading all of those books being trained by really wise teachers and putting myself out into the world as someone who's trying to work on healing and you know spreading some love around so everything i just said is easy for me to say it would be harder for a 16 year old or a 25 year old who had a miserable childhood through no fault of his or her, their own, who's currently living in a violent neighborhood to really embrace everything I just said. And I know that. So we have work to do of being able to prove that what Jason Reynolds said and what Bill Hook said, we need an ethic of love that fights against all dominations by powerful people, not just my personal domination, whether it's race or gender or whatever. Um, so, so getting that message out in a way that can be heard by a relatively safe middle-class person in some town and a relatively unsafe you know, person in a violent area, that's the work. How can we convince everyone of that? So it's not an easy task. Um, so that was a kind of a long belabored response to your question, but it has to do with love and really understanding that 
and knowing that the person across from me or with whom I'm interacting is as deserving and as capable of love as I am, um, as scared as I might be in the moment of that person, or they may be of me. Yeah, absolutely. You know, each week, it seems to be something dominating the news that is designed to spark, trigger <clears throat> racial animosity toward each other. A uh, week prior to that, it was the uh, song by Jared Allen, I believe. It was Allen is his last name, a gentleman who wrote the country song, Don't Try This in a Small Town. Oh. And they were saying how that was used to try to trigger violence. And it's going to be used because they created an environment, an atmosphere, whether that was its intentions or not, which I don't really believe there were. But then this situation with the riverboat, we could always find some reason to not like someone else or hate someone because of their difference. What I was thinking about the other day, I was saying to myself, if, again, this is a 54-year-old man thinking this way, who's, as you say, who's been studying personal development and personal growth literature for the last 30 years easily, psychology and things of that nature, and have a growth mindset. So I'm speaking in that kind of context, but what I find to be interesting is that to hate a particular race of people or a whole ethnicity or gender or sexual orientation of someone or religion, to hate that whole group because of that religion, that means that you walk around with a lot of bitterness in you. And I guarantee that you're not happy with your life. Like, I can't find a person that would say, well, I hate all Jews, or I hate all Blacks, or I hate all gays, I hate all women, I hate, hate all men, I hate all Catholics, I hate whatever your hate target group you focus your hatred on. And that's how you're thinking. I guarantee you're not happy with your life. I guarantee that you don't have any joy in your life at all. Because that means every time you see someone of that group, you're triggered. You're triggered with a whole lot of negative thoughts, a lot of hateful energy and now you've given them all your power they've dominated your world while they're in your presence whether it's on your tv set or whether it's your in a magazine or whether it's in social media posts or wherever you're seeing this individual that's triggering these negative emotions and for me it just makes sense to just flip that and say well i'm not going to have this hatred for any particular group of people. I'm gonna love people until, because I love being human. So as to your point, I'm gonna love you because we have things more in common than we don't. I mean, like for example, we were all stuck out in the desert. We were all suffer from heat stroke because we don't get water. We would all have to get water and protect ourselves. We wouldn't say, okay, well, you're white. You don't need as much water as I do. Or you're a man, you don't need as much water as I do, no. We all gonna need water to survive. If we're in a cold environment, we're all gonna need some form of clothing to keep us warm. We can't escape that. We all gonna have that. If it goes two or three days, we're gonna all become hungry and we'll need to eat, nourish ourselves. Those are the things that being fully human is about. If we focus on those things, then we can say, okay, what can we do together collectively to generate heat for all of us? Instead of each of us individual looking for ways to just warm our own selves, wouldn't it be better if we were to come together and kind of create a shelter that warms us all up so that we all benefit from it? So it's not just one of us trying to solve that answer and we're trying to compete against one another. So that's really why I love doing a show with you, because as you said before, we never met in person. We've had this online relationship for over a year and a half, but because we don't agree on everything, that's where the beauty of alignment comes in. Alignment doesn't mean that we have to agree on everything, because we, if we did agree on everything, we probably wouldn't enjoy talking to each other much, because we, we, we already know what the answers are. Like, okay, well, I already know that answer. You're going to say this, I'm going to say that, and we're both going to be agreeing. The beauty of alignment means that we have principles that govern how our behaviors are, and it's through that understanding that we extend trust to one another, we extend respect to one another, we 
create the energy of love with, with each other so that we don't let ourselves focus on the differences. We see the differences actually as things to be celebrated. The fact that you're a white Italian man who's now uh, approaching your 70s, there's a lot of wisdom there. There's a lot of things I can gain from that perspective on the world. I was, interesting enough, I had dinner, and this is, um, I'm making this happen more, but I was having dinner with a gentleman who's an older white gentleman and maybe his mid-70s. He's been like a mentor to me. He has been a mentor to me in Baltimore City. And I had dinner with him and his family. And they had, his wife was there, his uh, great nephew was there, and a great grandson, I'm sorry. And then her mother, who's 94. So you had that dynamic and cross-generational as well. Hmm. And I remember reading from this book to ask a person who's older, if you had, have you ever had a conversation when you was my age with someone your age and what did they say to you, right? Because mm-hmm. because so instead of looking at the differences and saying, okay, this is a white woman, older white woman, and this is where I used to, my old thoughts would have been on a racial thing. Well, I'm sure she grew up in a very racist time, so she's still probably harboring racist or at the very least prejudice bias towards me. And that's the energy and thoughts going through my mind. I'm thinking along the lines of, I wonder what this woman's world was, what she's seen differently, and what did she learn from the person who, when she was 54 and they were 94, what did she get from that conversation? So I got a chance to benefit from that particular knowledge that was shared. See, that's what I look for, those opportunities. And I believe that if you put yourself on a course that we advocate of being fully human, then that's what your mindset is in your situation. And the same thing with their grandson, he's uh, 11. I get a chance to learn from him, his perspective, his mm-hmm. worldviews, you know? And that's what I got from that conversation was the ability to really uh, transcend time between these two individuals and gain from that as we all broke bread together. And despite we were all different from a context of race, we were all being fully human in that moment. And it was a beautiful moment. Yeah, yeah that's, that's great. I love the idea of asking the older person that um, question. You know, back then, did you have any questions, you know, conversations with older folks and what did you learn from them? That's a, that's a good move. I like that. Yeah. Um, so I, I want to just add to that. I, I think I promised or I suggested I might just mention three views of love that serve me. Because I spoke about, you know, approaching the world with love, approaching another human being with love. And a lot of us use that word and say it to people. You know, I love you or, you know, I love that or whatever it happens to be. So three, um, I don't want to say definitions, but ways of holding the idea of love that I really think together are fairly, if not complete, um, they're pretty encompassing. So one comes from um, a, uh, I believe he's a, he's a Trappist monk, Brother David, now he's Benedictine monk, Brother David Stendhal Rast. Um, and he basically said, love is the joyful acceptance of belonging. So whether, so I can be self-love, I belong to this, I'm, I'm happy, I'm joyfully accept who I am in the world, which is really healthy. Um, I joyfully accept belonging with my family or my significant other or my close friends, I can love my friends. Um, I joyfully accept the world, the planet as it is. So that's one, I, the joyful acceptance of belonging. A second one is a little bit more complex, but it takes it to a different place. This comes from M. Scott Peck, who wrote The Road Less Traveled and probably six or seven other books. That love is the will to extend oneself for the purpose of nurturing one's own or another's spiritual growth. So it's the will, it's a choice you make in order to help yourself or to help somebody else grow. So that's not the same as joyful joyful acceptance of belonging, but kind of an addition to it. And then the last one comes from Marianne Williamson's um, views on A Course in Miracles, where she said that basically love is the absence of fear. 
So if you can imagine living your life with no fear, like there's nothing that you're afraid of. What's left is love. So you're not afraid of the end of a relationship. You're not afraid of illness or death. You're not afraid of people who look different. You're not afraid of anything. What remains when fear is gone, in fact, is love. So those three things together are great promises, are great prom practices, rather. How, can, how does it feel when, I'm, when I let go of my fear, all of my fear? That's not an easy thing to do for most of us because there are underlying fears that, uh, you know, most of us have. And that's a whole other issue. How does it feel to choose to make a sacrifice, to extend myself beyond what I normally do for my own benefit or to benefit somebody else? That's another example of love. And then how does it feel to joyfully accept belonging to whatever? So those are three practices to, to bring oneself back to a place of love. Those three I find to be a good place to start and to remember in moments of fear or anger. Oh, how can I joyfully accept belonging here? How can I extend myself? How can I let go of my fear? So those are pretty useful, um, but they're most useful if they're practiced on a regular basis. You know, not just when the ship is going down, <laughs> which, <laughs> yeah. you know, which is, you know, often we say, oh, that would be a really good thing to know. And then we forget about it. And then suddenly, you know, the ship is filling up with water. The iceberg is laughing at us. Um, the band is still playing on the deck and we know we're, we're going down. Um, it can still be helpful, but it's a little bit harder to do um, if it hasn't been practiced in my own experience. Yeah, you know, I was thinking about, well, thank you for sharing it. I think those are three great ways to really connect with the energy of love. That's something I'll definitely uh, add to my study as well, continue to grow in that area. One of the things I want to mention, it's a book I'm reading right now on the subject of our topic of violence and love. Now we threw love in there as because we I see love as a counter to violence. It's a book called Who Not How. It's a great book. Okay. It's, it's written by uh, Dr. Benjamin Hardy and, and Dan Sullivan, who's a coach, teacher coach practice. And the whole focus of the book, the whole premise is this, that anytime you're trying to accomplish something in your life, you never ask the question, who, how? Because how means you had to learn it. And then when you had to learn it, you had to spend time becoming an expert in it. Like if you're saying, okay, I'm going to market my book, but I got to create a website. I got to learn all these things. So you focus on the how as opposed to the who. Because if you focus on the who, you can find folks that can do it. So I mentioned all this to make this point that if we want to become more fully human in our lives, we should look at who who we can connect with, who can we build, because you mentioned the term tribe earlier, you know, I'm an advocate for creating tribes. Create your tribes of who's that can help you accomplish your goals that you have an alignment with. And I believe that as a witness, as a person who's experiencing it currently, that you're going to have better days than not. You're going to have more joyful moments than not. And you're going to have more beautiful experiences than not. As opposed to and you're gonna be less triggered for violence. You know, I find myself and I'm listening to audio books and I'm in my mindset of looking at what I can do to become a better human being. When I get out of my car and I'm walking into a door, I'm gonna let someone else go in first, even though they're gonna get in line before me. I'm not talking about just like a grocery store where it doesn't matter. I'm talking about in a business where we gotta do it like a bank where we're doing transactions and letting that person in behind me means that I have to stand behind them in person and we get inside the bank. But mm -hmm. because I've filled my mind and my spirit and my heart with being more fully human, I want this person to go before me and it's not an issue. There's no there's no regret. There's no doubt. As opposed to if I was listening to a certain form of music, you know, and I hadn't prepared myself mentally to accept and I'm not on the path to being fully human, my thought process is no. The last thing I want to do, I'm going to walk a little faster so I can get to the door first, get inside first, and they can get behind me. Hmm. And then I'm kind of also hoping that they would say something about it so I could be violent, right? And that's why I think most people 
walk around if we, who's not pursuing the path of being fully human. They walk around with those trigger moments, I call them, that you're looking for a method, an opportunity to be violent because you're not happy with your life, things are not going right in your life, and you have all this hatred. So that's what I want to share with the listening audience today, in addition to the great advice you gave as far as the three uh, ways to really tap into the energy of love, is also focus on not hating someone. Let the hatred go. Ask yourself, really, if you do hate a particular group of people for whatever differences they are to you, ask yourself why. Because I'm I'm 100% confident not everybody from that race, sexual orientation, gender, ethnicity has done you wrong or done something wrong. Mm. And there's something about someone who's done something good that you like, whether it's an entertainment or it's a movie or it's a book they've written or it's some form of compassion they've shared on a global scale. You can find someone of any of those elks for you to realize, I don't need to hate this whole particular race. And then in doing so, alleviates the energy from your mind, your spirit, and puts you on a better path. And now we've reached that section of the show where, and you kind of already gave us some great tips, but anything else you want to share with our listening audience with how they want to get rid of their violence tendencies and that they might be actually thinking? Yeah, so I mean, the one thing I would add to what I said about both violence and love is, and you just used the, the words, I want to just tune into that, is energy. Um, you know, the, the next time you allow, the next time I allow myself to feel, whether it's resentment, hate, or a uh, the propensity for violence, get real familiar with how that feels in the body. Because all of our emotions um, are, you know, based in, they, they arise in bodily sensations. We feel them in our in our neck, they're not in our brain. I mean, the brain reacts to what the body sends uh, in terms of signals, but you know, we feel them in our shoulders, our necks, our abdomen, our heart, at all different places. Get real familiar with how hate, resentment, and violence feel in the body when you're when you're moving toward violence. Get real tuned into that because different chemicals are released. And um, if I were had a better memory, I would I would say which ones. <laughs> but I don't remember. And then in a moment of acceptance, where you're really in a moment of love or gratitude, feel that. Feel how that feels in the body. And then make a choice. If you had to pick one of those feelings, the feelings that come up, the sensations that come up, the energy that comes up in hate, resentment, violence, as opposed to the energy that comes up in the body around love, gratitude, or acceptance, and he, you were going to feel one of those for the rest of your life. You could only pick one. Which would you prefer? And and commit to living that way. I mean, you're not going to live that way perfectly. I sure don't. I can still get upset and say stupid things at the wrong time. And, you know, we'll say stupid things even at the right time. There's still stupid things. Um, yeah, and I'm very good at that because I tend to love language and wield. I can wield it as a weapon. But I try not to do that much anymore. But feel the energy. Oh, yeah. You know, the tension is gone. This is good. I want to be like this, not like ready to, to pounce. You know, I can feel the tightness. I can feel my eyes get big. I can feel my respiration and my heartbeat shift. You know, both are accelerating um, when I'm angry or violent. So feel, feel the energy and then say to yourself, how would I prefer living? And if your honest answer is you want to be, prefer the energy of of hate and violence and resentment, um, then really get clear on why that is. And I would suggest talking to someone you trust about it because that's not a, a healthy way to be. And it could be based on some trauma. And trauma can be worked with by um, trained professionals because trauma isn't the thing that happened to you. Trauma is what you're holding your body based on the thing that happened. So the event is in the past. The thing that happened, the rape, the combat, the abuse, the neglect, that's in the past. That's not the trauma. The trauma is what you carry in your body since that event happened. Um, there are wonderful people in the world who can help you work with that. Um, and there's, you know, you read Gabor Mate, read 
Bessel van der Kolk, um, but it's get familiar with which energy you'd rather live with. Excellent, excellent. That's excellent advice. Definitely want to heed that advice because I believe that if you're not doing something as you just laid out proactively, intentionally in this world, then you don't let the culture of violence that is permeates through everything we watch to soon control you. Because again, like I, I said before, either you are living your plan or you following someone else's plan. And someone else's plan does never have your best interest at heart. It mm -hmm. has their interest and violence is gonna be one form of it, whether it's violence from you feeding your mind information and it's deteriorating your ambition and your desire to be growth minded or a violence where it's physical and you're doing something that's bringing you this uh, pain and suffering and trauma trauma to your body or those in your circle and your loved ones. So thank you for sharing that, Reggie. Yeah. Uh, we've reached the last part of the show where we want to give an example of someone who believes exhibiting fully human characteristics and qualities. And I'll be real quick with mine since we're kind of going over our time. And I would say in the space of love, you mentioned them several times throughout the show, and I may have mentioned them before as well, but that's what I'm in that space right now. And it's not Martin Luther King Jr. And mainly because of the fact is, despite violence happening to him on a daily basis, um, he was even stabbed once by a black woman before he was able to did the actual bus boycott with in Selma, Montgomery. So to me, he's an example of someone I look to when I have those doubts of, can it be about love? Is love a better way? And I look at his life, I look at what he's accomplished, I look at how many people respect him and how much he's admired. And that helps me do the proverbial, write my ship to true north and stay on that path. But things he things he's done and accomplished in this life. So Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. is my example of someone who definitely lived a very few, fully human life. Yeah, beautiful. Thank you for that, King. And so mine is a, actually kind of a bittersweet one. Um, so I had my, in December, I'll celebrate the 20th anniversary of having both of my hips replaced. Um, and there's a whole story behind why I needed that, which I won't get into. But the the doctor who replaced my hips was, uh, his name was Chris Stapps, Keggy, K-E-G-G-I. He was born in 1934, 35, I think 34, um, in Latvia. Um, was, so was a child during World War II, um, post-World War II, when the Russians began to, the Soviet Union began to um, you know, make moves into uh, parts of, of Eastern Europe. His family escaped to Germany and eventually came to Connecticut. He was in Yale when he was 16 or 17. He was a smart guy went to Yale Medical School, um, studied orthopedics. And then in 1964, he went to Vietnam as a surgeon in the US Army. And he spent a year in Vietnam putting bodies back together. Um, you know, so he had a, you know, that kind of experience. Long story short, he came back and over the course of time, he developed his own approach to hip replacement, which is called, it's non-invasive, it's called the anterior approach. It doesn't cut through muscle. Um, and he died this past July 4th. I just found out yesterday. Uh, and um, he was, I was in a lot of pain in uh, the late 1990s through 2003 when I had my hips replaced. And he was exactly the right guy at the right time for me. He had this amazing history. He would travel back to Latvia every year and train surgeons there. He trained surgeons at Yale. And I don't know how many replacements he did. You know, I'm one of, you know, definitely over a thousand people that he helped. Um, but just this kind of, you know, in terms of living a fully human life, he was funny. He was arrogant in his own way. He was more conservative politically than I was. So we'd get into interesting conversations about politics around election time, around the 2004 election especially. But um, lived a 
fully human life, had has four, three or four surviving daughters and grandkids. But I was just really palpably sad when I learned of his death just yesterday uh, on July 4th. Last time I had spoken to him was like 2008 in my, you know, for five years to do regular checkups. But a guy whose full humanity literally took away significant physical pain that I was suffering through um, in my 40s. So Chris Tapps, Keggy, MD, a deep bow of gratitude to him. Uh, Chris Tapps, Keggy, MD, may you rest in peace and power. So definitely thank you for yeah. sharing. Yeah. Well, Reggie, we got through today's show. Again, despite our technical challenges, you know, we, we, we uh, persevered and Hopefully, uh, we won't have these issues next week. But if you all bear with us today and bear with us last week, we hope you all got a lot of great insight and information on violence because it permeates our society. And we have to figure out a way to deal with it. Reggie laid out some great insights. Definitely highly recommend this book as a great way to understand the historical way violence has been attributed to the society and why we need to heal. And the healing process needs to begin in order for us to now put ourselves on the path to become more fully human. So again, Reggie, thank you for your choosing this topic, your investing the time and energy with coming on the show and writing the book, of course. Thank you, listening audience, for bearing with us, those who hung out with us today, despite these cynical issues, and those who might watch the show and replay. Thank you for engaging with us and putting yourself on the journey to become more fully human. And until next Wednesday at 10 a.m., I reckon our Wish everyone a blessed and great time and wish you a peaceful journey along the lines of being for him. Thank you.